we are going to look at receptors and sense organs in the human body. The sense organs that we're going to investigate will be the eye and the ear. And receptors, if we could remember, they are found at one end of the sensory neurons. And these receptors are involved in picking up little changes that occur in the external or internal environment. These changes are what we refer to as stimuli. So the receptors pick up different stimuli and for the different stimuli, we will then require different types of receptors, each adapted to a particular type of stimulus. Hence, we have here our first one will be photoreceptors. When I hear photo, I think of light because these receptors respond to light. They pick up light stimuli in the environment. And they are the rods and cones which are found in the retina of the eye. Hence, the eye is a sense organ because it has photoreceptors. It then picks up light stimuli. The second one, chemo receptors. When I hear chemo receptors, when I hear chemo, I think of chemicals because these receptors respond to chemicals. For example, the olfactory cells that are found in nasal cavity and taste buds that are found on the tongue. The next one, thermo receptors. When I think of thermo, I think of thermometer, I think of temperature because they respond to temperature. For example, the Ruffini and Cross corpuscles and the Meccano receptors. When I think of Meccano, I think of mechanical because they respond to mechanical stimuli. For example, the Pacinian and Mesner's corpuscles in the maculae that are found in the ear. We shall look at that. Then, Propio receptors. Propio goes with positioning. And these receptors are responsible or sensitive to position, tension, and movement that are found in muscles, tendons, maculae, and cristae in the vestibular apparatus. Those are the those are major or few types of receptors that we find in the body. The human eye. Before we look deep into the human eye, let's first understand these two concepts, binocular vision and stereoscopic vision or stereoscopy. Now, we understand a normal human being has two eyes, and each eye makes an independent image of an object. So when you're looking at an object, a single object, you see that object with two eyes. And each eye makes an independent image. And each eye sends an image to the brain. And what happens in the brain? The image is being integrated such that all the similarities are matched. The similarities between the two images that were sent from the two eyes, such that all the similarities are matched. And the differences are added because there are certain angles at which each eye looks that the other eye cannot see at that angle. So all these differences are added to create a large field of view and at the same time to generate just one image, an integrated image of that object. That's why you don't see double. And this is facilitated by communication between the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere of the cerebrum that's brought about by the corpus callosum. Now, hence, the binocular vision refers to the ability to focus on just one object with both eyes and yet creating only a single image. That's what it means. And this is aided by the three pairs of muscle that are found outside each eye, each eye, the oculomotor muscles. On the other hand, stereoscopic vision. This is the ability to perceive depth or depth of perception. What does it mean? This is what makes us be able to know how deep 
an environment is. For example, this can be used to walk upstairs. For you to put one foot on the next step up, it means you are able to know exactly how high that step is. Otherwise, you would easily tumble. This is what we lose sometimes when we buy some of these shades where you, when you wear the shade and you put it on and you feel as if the ground is deeper than it actually is. You will see the people walking as if they are searching to, to make sure that they know exactly where or how high or how deep the foot has to go. You will see them looking at the ground as if they are about to tumble because they've lost that ability of, of perceiving depth. They've lost, they've lost stereoscopic vision. It is what also enables three-dimensional vision. So, what is the importance of stereoscopic vision and binocular vision? The importance of stereoscopic vision is to give depth of perception so that we can walk, for example, upstairs, so that it gives us a wider field of view and it gives us precision about depth. Binocular vision helps with performance of skills such as catching, grasping, and locomotion. Protection and structure of the eye. Firstly, where do we find the eye? I know most of you will just say the eye is found in the head. It sounds very funny. Otherwise, the eye is found in the socket of the skull or in the orbit. Now, how then is the eye protected? The eye being found in the socket of the skull means it is surrounded by the bony framework of the skull, which is hard enough to offer some degree of protection to the eye. Additionally, the eye is protected by the eyebrows, probably from sweat that could drip all the way from the forehead into the eye. It's also protected by the eyelashes, the ones that people extend very much so that they can even tear someone on the, at the back on Saturdays, especially the ladies. The eyelashes protect the eye from foreign particles that could fly into the eye. The eyelashes do that together with the eyelids that cover each time you're blinking so that you can use tears to cleanse the surface of the eye. Again, the eyes are protected by tears that are produced from the lacrimal glands, also known as the tear glands. The tear glands therefore produce tears that flush into the eyes to cleanse the eyes. Although some people use these tears for crying over broken hearts and maybe celebrating virtuous events. Added to those, we have the glands of Maybone that are not shown here that produce an oily substance that we call sebum. Sebum helps to lubricate the surface of the eye to make it frictionless. And it is sebum that usually accumulates here, kind of yellowish substance that accumulates here in the morning when you wake up. And I know some people bring them to school to come and show to their friends how they're progressing at home. So sebum accumulates here and that's what you normally take off in the morning. It's oily substance that helps to lubricate the eye. So basically, that is how the eye is protected. When we we'll look at the eye, at when looking at the eye in more details, we shall see some other levels of protection. Now, internally, the eye is made up of three layers when we look at it from the back. The first one is a whitish layer, which is referred to as the sclera. It is what makes the eye look white, the eyeball. It's tough, it offers mechanical protection to the eye or offers protection against 
mechanical injuries. That's the outermost one. Followed by the middle layer, which is the choroid. The choroid, please don't confuse this with the, with the chorion, which is found around the embryo. The choroid is dark in color or reddish brown because it contains melanocytes, which are special cells that produce the substance melanin, which gives color, color to the choroid. This color is in the form of pigments that help to absorb excess light that is present in the inner side of the eye. And in so doing, by absorbing the excess light, the inner part of the eye is kept at most times dark. This is to avoid excess reflections in the eye. The inner side of the eye is then kept dark. Otherwise, if it was very bright in there, you would think there are shooting stars in your head. So, again, the choroid is that layer which is vascularized. And when we say vascularized again, it means that it has blood vessels. So the choroid has blood vessels to allow blood to flow around the eye. For what purpose? The purpose is such that blood can bring nutrients to the eye, oxygen, vitamins, and everything that the eye needs in order to keep it healthy. And it also takes away waste products carbon dioxide, nitrogenous waste. So the choroid has blood vessels to assist the eye in nutrition and respiration. Again, the inner layer is the retina. Inner one is the retina. The retina has photoreceptors the photoreceptors we spoke about earlier in the other section the rods and cones they are found scattered all around the retina and when we look at the retina we see a depression somewhere here a kind of depression that we refer to as the fovea centralis or simply put the yellow spot and this spot is yellowish in color because there is an accumulation of cones. Cones have the pigment called iodopsin in them, which is kind of yellowish or orange in color. That's why it gives them that, that spot here, a yellowish appearance. Hence, we call it the yellow spot. That is the region for the clearest vision. And cones are therefore used for viewing color, colorful vision. So the yellow spot is the part at which when we look at an object, everything is put in place to make sure that the focus of the light entering the eye is brought towards the yellow spot for the clearest vision. So that is the retina. The rods are also present in the retina. The rods are used for vision at night, mostly. And they contain the pigment rhodopsin. Remember, I spoke once about pigments and their effects here. The pigments are colorful substances. And color is essential in trapping light. So pigments will be useful such that light can easily be trapped. Anything that has color can trap light. That's why black traps almost all or all, all the different light spectra. And white reflects all the different light spectra. So anything that has color can trap some degree of light. It is then vital that our rods and cones should have colors in the form of pigments so that they can trap light stimulus. Now, when we then look at the sclera, again, I'm going back with the sclera, the outermost layer. The sclera at the back of it, the sclera at the back is opaque. It means it's not transparent. 
But when we take the sclera to the front, the front part of it forms a transparent structure through which light can pass like through a transparent glass. That transparent structure is a modification of the, of the sclera to form a structure that we call the cornea. So at the front of the eye, the sclera is modified into a cornea, which is transparent, allowing light to pass through. So we have the cornea at the front. And lining, lining the cornea is a thin layer, a thin layer that appears on the surface of the cornea. And that thin layer is what we call the conjunctiva. The conjunctiva therefore offers some other degree of protection to the eye, the conjunctiva. Past the cornea, we have the iris. The iris here is represented in the form of rods, but that is not exactly what they look like. This is because we are looking at the eye at a side view, otherwise the iris is more or less circular with a little aperture, an opening in the middle when we're looking at it from front view. So that will be the iris front view and that little opening that is left the little opening here is then what we call the pupil. <coughs> Sorry. Is then what we call the pupil. Again, moving backwards, we will then have a lens which is also transparent and filled with fluid that can allow light to pass through such that it can reach the retina. The shape of the lens can be changed or altered to be able to perceive light coming from either near or far objects in the process of accommodation. We'll discuss that later on. The choroid at some point gets also modified here to form a thick body of muscle that we call the ciliary body, which is made up of ciliary muscles. And this ciliary body or is attached to ligaments that we refer to as suspensory ligaments, which then also get attached to the lens. The ciliary body with its ciliary muscle works with the suspensory ligaments synergistically to alter the shape of the lens. Hence, they are able to either stretch the lens or make it assume a more dome shape. In other words, they are able to make the lens more concave or more convex. We shall see that when we are looking at accommodation. When all the light, when light has been, has entered into the eye and has reached the retina, the photoreceptors will then pick up the stimulus. Remember, receptors pick up stimulus, they perceive the changes that occur in the external or internal environment. They pick up the stimulus and they will combine all the stimuli and later on channel them to the optic nerve. That is the optic nerve, which also has blood vessels in it. All the light stimuli are converted to impulses by the photoreceptors and sent to the optic nerve and the optic nerve will then carry these impulses to the brain such that the brain can be able to make sense on the kind of impulse or the kind of information and that is why it is widely said that 
It is not the eye that sees, it is the brain that sees. At the point where the optic nerve makes contact with the retina, and we look at it here, at the point where the optic nerve makes contact with the retina, here, there are therefore no rods and cones in this region here. And if there's no rods and cones in this region here, it means that no light stimuli can be perceived at this region. And because that's the case, that is why we also refer to this region here as the blind spot. We call it the blind spot. Now, looking again at the eye, after we've dealt with all the little structures that are present in the eye, we can identify two chambers that form. There is a chamber that forms at the front part of the lens or the left side on, of the lens with reference to the diagram we have in front of us presently. There is a chamber here. That chamber is filled up with liquid, <coughs> fluid, we also call it the anterior chamber. It is filled with fluid that we refer to as aqueous humor. And there is another chamber that is found on the right side of our lens here, otherwise the posterior chamber. It is filled up with vitreous humor. Now, you could get confused as to which is which. Is it aqueous or vitreous humor? At least if you get used to the names aqueous and vitreous, maybe the positioning could be a problem. It's easy. Light enters and goes in that direction into the eye. So when it passes, it passes the first chamber. I'll call that aqueous because I'm here dealing with two letters, A and V. A for aqueous and V for vitreous. I'm sure when we look at the letters in alphabetical order, A comes before V. Hence, as light, as light is going in, I will pass through A before V. Hence, my first part is aqueous humor and the second one is vitreous humor. So that's how you can easily remember these chambers.